Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our artist discussion panel for our current exhibition, Witchgrass. I'm Annika Early, Speedwell's Managing Director. We are very lucky to have today's panel moderated by Kathleen Miller. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us. Kathleen is an herbalist and poet and artist based in Scarborough at Sanctuary Gardens. Her practice involves a close and sensitive look at the ways in which humans and plants connect in terms of nurturing, attention, connectedness to other forms of life, and is anchored in traditional herbalist practices combined with a more personal experimental approach. I'll introduce our work and our artists, and then they and Kathleen will discuss the work on view, and we'll hold some time at the end of our discussion this evening for questions. We are located in Portland, Maine, which is traditional territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy, including Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet nations. We acknowledge the painful history of colonialization, genocide, and forced removal from this territory, and recognize that we exist on this land because of the stewardship of both ancestral and contemporary indigenous individuals and nations. We are an artist-run nonprofit gallery that promotes and archives the work of women who have made a lifetime commitment to their artistic practices. Our programming includes solo and group exhibitions, residencies, community events, and the publications of catalogs and documentaries. The four featured artists in Witchgrass are Josephine Chase, Karen Gillardi, Hilary Irons, and Juliet Carlson. Josephine Chase is a visual artist from Burlington, Vermont. Her areas of exploration include expanded field painting, art historical analysis, and cultivating, capturing, and reframing domestic spaces. Chase's work is focused on hybrid hybridity, locating function, cultural signals, and collective memory through the use of inherited ready-mades that are remixed into paintings and installations. In her writing, Chase interrogates the Black curatorial experiences and challenges white Eurocentric notions of representation. Chase is also the co-founder of Mama Pepper Co., a Liberian specialty food producer. Karen Gillardi is a Maine-based artist working across multiple mediums to model resiliency and adaptation found in nature and industry. Using handmade and industrial production techniques, she creates systems of pattern, modularity, assembly, disassembly, and variation, and mutation. Gillardi's work in design and manufacturing serves as research and a site for creative collaboration from other artists, often translating ideas and images from the studio into commercial products. Hilary Irons is a painter who has lived and worked in Portland, Maine for the past decade. Hilary received her MFA in painting from the Yale School of Art in 2008 and maintains a studio space at Space Studios. Her paintings deal with the visual window of the landscape and nature as seen through the competing lenses of observational realism and decorative or abstract application of form. In addition to her studio practice, Hilary is the exhibitions director for the University of England, New England. Juliet Carlson was raised in New York City and has lived in Maine for many years. She's a multimedia artist and curator who received her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago mm -hmm. and attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture and Haystack School of Crafts, Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. Based on observation of the real, she makes work that has magical and fantastical elements. Fabricated in fiber and man-made materials, the flowers, mosses, lichens, and plants she creates allude to artificiality and the human-created circumstances like global warming, the greenhouse effect, and climate change, while at the same time they describe through brilliant colors and textures what is at stake. We rely on community donations to keep going at Speedwell, and thank you very much to all of you who've made donations tonight. If you'd like to make a donation for future programming, Candace will add the donation link in the chat below. We are so very grateful for your attendance and support this evening. Which grass is on view at our gallery through October 30th. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to Kathleen. So I wanted to start tonight by just reading um, the poem, Which Grass, which was included in the, um, in the show packet when you go into the gallery, because I think there's a lot in there that um, will evoke conversation and I'll just ask people to um, respond as they like after I'm finished reading the poem. So, Witchgrass by Louise Gluck. Something comes into the world unwelcome, calling disorder disorder. 
If you hate me so much, don't bother to give me a name. Do you need one more slur in your language, another way to blame one tribe for everything? As we both know, if you worship one God, you only need one enemy. I'm not the enemy, only a ruse to ignore what you see happening right here in this bed, a little paradigm of failure. One of your precious flowers dies here almost every day and you can't rest until you attack the cause, meaning whatever is left, whatever happens to be sturdier than your personal passion. It was not meant to last forever in the real world, but why admit that when you can go on doing what you always do, mourning and laying blame, always the two together. I don't need your praise to survive. I was here first, before you were here, before you ever planted a garden. And I'll be here when only the sun and moon are left and the sea and the wide field. I will constitute the field. So if anybody would like to um, respond, any of the artists would like to respond to that poem in terms of how it relates to your work or just your thoughts about how that speaks to themes of the show. I'd love to hear that. Thanks. I hear in it the um, cycles, the cycles of, of life as being mourned and blamed as if they're not the way things should be, which shows to me a, a disconnect from the reality of what what we where we live on this planet seeing seeing disorder as unwelcome and it seems like a real um state of denial and um disconnection from what's here i think what you're saying is really interesting in terms of um the idea of there being a correct and an incorrect way for natural um processes to unfold. Um, the reason that I was so interested in the beginning sort of planning stages of the show and which grass as a plant, you know, even before I had read the poem, um, is just because it is so tenacious and it has this amazing capacity to hold on and to sort of stake a claim in a way that seems really contrary. Um, and I love that about you know, witch grass and other plants that are considered to be weeds, they're, you know, they have a certain kind of beauty, but it's a really uncultivated kind of beauty and um, a really sort of uh, disruptive presence. Um, and I like how, you know, I like how they disrupt an order that is imposed. Um, I feel like a lot of the time um, in my life as a woman, um, a cisgendered white woman, I feel like there are um, places in my life where, you know, tenacity and contrariness and ugliness are sort of um, my my tools that I can use. Um, and I do see a kind of common language with, with weeds in that respect. So yeah, thank you, um, Kathleen, for the question. Yeah, and just to um, bounce right off of that, it was a great read in terms of thinking about um, for the pieces that I I showed, the cards that I was working with, the moment of intervention really came for me at, at seeing how much they were a part of the landscape again, right? And like all of the ways that the human function had sort of abandoned it and then the way that nature repurposed it, whether that was with like, wild weeds growing out of it or with like even animals inhabiting like these car objects and just thinking about like that they didn't lose their aesthetic power at all even though they were going through these different life cycles so yeah which grass is really interesting to me too um thinking about the work through the lens of of the poem yeah you know it's interesting i hadn't thought about this but hillary when you use the word tenacity and you talked about having that be a part of your life. I remember as a kid when my mother really wanted to insult me, she would say that I was so... Yeah, I guess what I really felt reading the poem, well, I mean, first when Hillary found the poem, which I thought was great, I loved the title and I felt like because it was 
we were going to be four women doing it that I loved the, the witchy idea and the grass and and reading it I guess just what really struck me was just the pain you know that's what came forth was pain and you know I I think you could see the pain in various ways and I guess that you know the question is do the do the plants feel the pain? Does the does the earth feel the pain? The pain? Do we feel the pain? Feeling badly about what we're doing to the earth? But but that was sort of the predominant thing to me was just it was just really painful to read, you know, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, it seemed to be describing like a dysfunctional family relationship or something like that, where the whole thing is being misunderstood, you know. The, <laughs> the all the amazing qualities of the witch grass that it is tenacious that it can propagate in these kind of slim pickings kind of conditions and be its full self as what it is and I find that ad admirable but that it's totally misunderstood as like the villain and in, in the person who wants to control a certain a space a certain way it just feels like a missed opportunity all around you know all the lessons that it has to teach and that it and that in in reverse that it's seeing the human as the same as a weed itself you know whereas it doesn't have to be that way um so it seems like a missed opportunity <laughs> for both entities or like the with Josephine, like you're saying, with the with the car doors, you know that they can it can become like a habitat for animals or something an armature for the plants to grow over. You know, doesn't have to mean that that object was wrong to be there necessarily. Well, one of the things that we were sort of like discussing that Kathleen had kind of prompted was our initial responses uh, to the poem, and I thought that what you were talking about too, Karen. Um, the idea of the format of giving the grass itself in the poem, this like anthropomorphized, um, almost human agency, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of trying to think about how that power brokerage between, again, it's an oppositional binary that we can maybe mm -hmm. deconstruct too in this conversation is this idea of like, like man and nature as these like separate things too. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that coming up for you in the poem, I guess, and I didn't mean to put yeah. you on the spot, but I thought it was a really great question. Yeah. Yeah. That the, that you could hear the voice of the writer, um, in the way it spoke for the grass as having bought into this dynamic of, like you said, this power struggle of this binary where we're in opposition and kind of setting that as the framework is as the core like the assumption that that's how it is. And it, and it does show like a lack of, of possibility, you know, or, or missing whole other paradigm of looking at the relationship that we don't have to be. Not everyone sees us in relationship to uh, living thing, other living things in this way where we're separate from it. So even the, the way the garden is described is making a certain assumption about the opportunities of gardening and that mm. you know that tending the land isn't that we're not a part a, a natural part and our tending of the land wouldn't be a natural part of nature is is like a whole assumption <laughs> you know so I, I did find that problematic as I'm trying to learn differently uh you know learn to think differently of it all and I'm my, with my work I started out feeling a little bit displaced when I moved to South Portland and I really looked to the weeds in the on the land in the landscape as sort of a model to follow you know how why are they here what what are they doing what can I learn from them before I started planting any type of garden per se and um I don't think everybody wants to have a garden where the weeds are looked at as an adversary necessarily so but I, I think what, I mean, just, I just heard the last bit of what you were talking about. Um, and I think, you know, that paradigm that we are as 
people living in this place and time, like we've inherited all of these paradigms of views of the, of the rest of the world. And so how do we learn to get out of those? You know, how do we, how do we disconnect the, the binaries of thought that are built into so many of our systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way we think and talk and um, everything we do is structured in this way to oppose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, the, and, and with the, um, the title, um, Hillary, that you were talking about part of, and Juliet too, are they were mentioning how the title witch grass and the idea of the witch and that part of the part of it, um, that part of it, where the, the knowledge or an actual alternative paradigm is really villainized and was historically villainized. Um, so having a closeness or a sp whether it's spiritual or just a knowing was um, dark, <laughs> dark and evil and not to be trusted. <laughs> so it was kind of designed it out so that if we were disoriented and disconnected, that was somehow more respectable. And, and having this order imposed was, was something aspirational versus really being part of, part of the world here, but part of the natural world. Well, and just in this conversation, I'm here, you know, I hear the, um, the ways that I find myself struggling with language to, you know, as we try to unlearn or, or untangle ourselves from these ways that have been um, accepted in terms of how we should live our lives or how we should think about the world. Um, you know, the English language is such a dead end dead language. I mean, I've, I've only been thinking about this maybe the last five or six years, unfortunately, but as somebody who works with plants all the time and, and teaches about plants, I find myself in this struggle to find English way, you know, words in English that describe the relationship I feel without um, separating myself. So how do we talk about being of nature rather than, you know, the na nature out there, the natural world out there? I mean, just the ways that we speak about things. Um, and I'm curious to hear any of you speak about the ways that you see maybe art being able to intervene in that separation um, or the binary ways of thinking that we have, that, that our society and our culture um, has, how can art offer us a different kind of language to think about the world and our place in it? I would just say to start out the conversation about art and language is, you know, the thing that I find to be so powerful about visual art is that it's speaking with a non-verbal language. It's a language that doesn't need to rely on words. Um, it doesn't need to rely on the sa same kind of symbolic meaning that words carry. Um, and in that way, it's not limited by the sort of symbol set of, um, you know, linguistically based cultural associations. So for myself, personally, as an artist, just, you know, in my own practice, I feel like um, drawing from observation and working optically and thinking about how um, drawing teaches me about the world that I live in and allows me to focus and maintain attention. Um, all of that, I think, is a function of language, um, verbal, written, you know, word-based language being dropped during the time that the drawing is being achieved or the painting is being achieved. Um, and I think that that also goes back to, you know, maybe the primary reason why I find plants to be such an engaging and kind of perpetually self-renewing subject in my work because they are other life forms in the world. Um, they're saying something to me. They're other kind of physical you know, manifestations of life on earth, but they don't rely on language in any way, right? Um, not even to the extent that, for example, 
I don't know, like bumblebees rely or honeybees rely on language um, or dolphins, you know, plants are doing something totally different. Um, so I love the way that the communication that I can sense when I'm perceiving them and learning about them through, through drawing and observation. I just like how that unfolds in a way that is impossible to describe in words. So that's why for me, visual art is the key to, you know, situating myself in a present that involves, um, you know, living on earth and in a body around other embodied live things. The idea too, as you were speaking about how this idea of like rituals and patterns are performed through this type of like unseen labor of plants too. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say that really quick. Sorry, Julia. Wait, can you say that again? You said that really quick. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, as Hillary was talking to, I was thinking a lot about how um, a lot of our work is interested in, in pattern and pattern making too, and sort of like the ritual of plant life too, and how it exists kind of in this like coded unseen matrix that has all this information stored mm -hmm. um, was just really cool. So I just wanted to say that before I forgot about it, but I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's great. Yeah, that's super great. interesting. Um, yeah, and I, I think too, what's interesting, like Hillary, when you talked, I liked how you said being present. And um, I, I find for myself that like, when I get inspired, if I'm looking, if I'm in the woods or I'm looking at some Lugosa roses or is I get, I feel really present. You know, I'm just there, I'm with everything. And, and so the step that is, is, can sometimes be really difficult and feel really kind of forced is to then describe that, you know, how does that fit in? How, why am I making this? You know, what is the context of all this? And, you know, I, I can do it, you know, but the, the impulse is so not a verbal place. You know, it's, it's so, like visual and sort of spiritual of the being being and um so yeah to to put the the words and you know i don't know if this has anything to do with anything but um um the other day we um my husband and i were listening to a carolina wren i think was the name of the bird and um i think he was saying he was saying what the sound was of the you know, I, I forget, I, I know he's on this thing, but the sound of what the bird says. And it just struck me how, when I, when you really listen to the sound that the bird was making, there were no like consonants or vowels, or there was not a sound that we could replicate with words, with letters, with pronunciation. You know, it was just this sound, it was tonal, it was, you know, and I, I just, I don't know, it just really struck me. It was like, wow, we can't like say that, you know? So maybe just shifting gears a little bit, um, thinking about the show itself. Um, as I engaged, I've only been to the show one time, unfortunately, I hope to come back um, before it's down because it's a really beautiful show. Um, but as I engaged with it, I thought about the work as a whole, um, which created this feeling for me of, of being a body in a landscape. And I'm really curious to hear um, how you see your own work and the forms and images you create in relationship to the other bodies that inhabit the same space. How do you see that relationship? And what does it mean to make images or objects that represent other bodies? And how does it alter your relationship with them? Like, I think what, you know, talking about like trying to put something into language is one thing, but like, how does, because that alters our relationship. I relate to that question. Um, and that I think the observational drawings that um, are similar to Hillary's experience, you know, I'm looking to the plants and forms and uh, botanical forms that I'm drawing. I'm looking for clues of how, what strategies they use to do what they do and um, particularly around like resiliency. Um, and so there's that aspect of my practice where I'm observing as a way of, you know, 
learn so the drawing process itself is like a way of recording recording those observations and that not it's not always obvious to me what what they are but through the transcribing them some, you know I may start to understand a little bit better and then there is this instinct to the, to have the drawing itself be a life force and then an instinct to want to bring it into fr from some concept as a drawing it still feels like an idea and a concept but some how making it into a sculpture or an object through printmaking it then becomes embodied and becomes an object that enters into our a real real actual space that we can interact with um so i'm not sure if that exactly speaks to what you're saying um kathleen but uh, I think the pieces I have in the show are those efforts to embody the recordings that I've made and, and make them into <laughs> living things themselves, you know, um, and allow the drawing to kind of move from one thing to the next um, it, in the different prints that it becomes and different sculptures that it becomes. Because I'm, I'm, I'm making a print onto a fabric that then turn, is turned into a sculpture and then is re- presented as maybe a fabric drawing of the sculpture. So it's kind of multi-generational, but I'm kind of mimicking the, the bodies and the forms that I'm seeing. So, and then I think it's interesting to have them sit in the space with the other pieces in the show. Um, so it's a little bit like mimicking the life forms. I'm curious, Karen, what kind of life forms you're looking at? Like, are there specific plant plants or other bodies that you're interested in they're, they're mostly they're mostly weeds um weeds that i i didn't know the names of that i didn't understand i didn't know what they were you know um close to my home um either in the you know the edge of the yard um adjacent to the sidewalk creeping in between those in those funny spaces um or along the pathway that i walk um along casco bay the green the green uh mile they call it in south portland so um a lot of the, a lot of the things i was drawing i had very little understanding of what they were and, and didn't have any names for them so um still still trying to identify a lot of them um I was gonna say that, yeah, Kathleen, I would agree that in my experience of the exhibition, which, um, you know, Juliet Carlson and I sort of, you know, put together, um, but, you know, we knew we would get a surprise when um, the installation happened and all the work was together in the space. I also experienced the show as, you know, very anchored around um, the idea of the body and space and the experience of multiplicity, um, the experience of seeing the sort of, you know, disembodied images of plants kind of encroaching in a way. Um, there's not real plants in the space. There's, there's really only images of them that remind us of how plants behave um, in the environment and uh, kind of mimic that without you know, really holding it. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I love the way that every artist is sort of, you know, coming up to and confronting that idea of encroaching forms that, you know, in and of themselves are very small and delicate. And when they, when they mass together in certain numbers, they become overwhelming and, um, you know, threaten to dominate. And I think that that, you know, it's true in the illuminated car doors that Josephine Chase has made. It's true in Karen's um, sewn constructions and hanging sculptural piece um, in Juliet's wallpaper and the way that the plants kind of adhere to these like pieces of furniture and other objects. Um, and in my work, I feel like um, you, you know, even before I understood what the show was going to look like and the form it was going to take, I did feel as though there was something maybe a little overtly pictorial about my paintings where they have this kind of window like function, allowing you to, you know, psychically move into a different space, a differently illuminated space, um, maybe, um, where that which is physically small can become larger with observation. but. 
I just, you know, I wanted to make a piece that related much more directly to the body and the experience of, um, you know, moving through specifically water um, with your body. Um, I was swimming a lot in the ocean this summer and thinking a lot about uh, submarines. Um, and I know that that's not exactly the same topic as plants, but it does have, you know, um, I think a relationship just in terms of thinking about how we relate to things that we know are in the world and that we encounter, but we don't really understand, right? So I made this piece with two drawings on large black pieces of paper of depth charges. So in this case, they're World War II era um, depth charges, which are sort of anti-submarine um, uh, sinking bombs that detonate when they reach a certain water pressure. Um, so the idea with this piece is that the, the top of them is about the height of um, your chest. And you can, if you stand close enough to the, to the piece, you can feel as though these, these shapes are sinking down in a really heavy way. And that these cut forms of seaweed that I made are kind of floating up. And, um, you know, the water surface becomes something that you can't obtain anymore. It's, it's out of reach. And so there's a sense of, you know, maybe drowning or um, losing control a little bit. Um, and a sense of heaviness and floating. So yeah, so I was thinking about that a lot with that piece specifically. So it was really great to me to see how the other artists work was also, you know, really responding to that idea. So thanks. I really liked Hillary when you, I think you just said it right now, but the scale, the difference in scale that the work has in the show altogether. And that, you know, it just got me thinking about it because you know, when we when we put this show together, we chose artists whose work we really like, and then it just kind of came together as it came together. And I am just starting to make the connections of how things look in the gallery and what's going on because it was so much to get it in there and set it up and look at the you know information. So just to hear or, or to read when you wrote about scale, it really just got me thinking and. Um, I think it's something that made me think about in terms of my work is that my little room there and then the other side is really um, comes off as this kind of domestic space. You know, there's this, there's chairs, there's a quilt, you know, that's um, made that has the, you know, domestic connotation of women's work and quilt making and embroidery in general and the wallpaper and, and so that just got me thinking about that as a scale, you know, of the home um, and the scale of the home in terms of the bigger scale of, you know, being outside and then of bringing the flowers, the small flowers into the home. And, um, and then Hillary's around the corner. I love those little, those little drawings, the small, which we figured out early on that those were kind I don't know if, if you had an intention, but to me, they look like dew drops, you know, when you see dew and you can see like little reflections of what's in the dew drop. And um, so that is just this really tiny thing. And then my glass domes that are about observation of tiny things. And I don't know, and I, I, I'm just kind of going off <laughs> this way. Josephine, I was thinking that you and I have this parallel of, um, you know, we've taken objects, recognizable objects. You have the car doors, I have the chairs, and we're working with these recognizable objects and transforming them with the painting. And um, yeah, so I liked that. And Karen, I love how all your lines and mark making and systems just kind of weave into everything else, you know, that's just sort of makes everything connected in there and kind of moves through. <laughs> So that's what I got out of the show. <laughs> yeah, and then thinking about your question about um, Kathleen, about like bodies in space in relationship to us and our representation of non-human bodies. Um, yeah, I agree with Juliet that use of the ready-made um, and especially thinking about man-made objects in relationship to 
like, again, this idea of like a brokenness or an incompleteness. And then that nature growing through it is somehow this like icon, if you see a car and it's been um, overrun by weeds, it gives this idea that a body has like left it as well, right? It's like every bit that surrogate of that human presence. Um, but it's complicated. It becomes like a, a narrative, something to project into um, as we watch, like, I don't know, that type of, um, not, not even manipulation, but just functioning of nature too. Um, so I, I think a lot about that in terms of seeing that as potential and then thinking about what's the best way to work with that too and kind of honor it in all of those spaces too, not idealize um, an, an original function, but to really try to hold all of those different spaces as well as, is really important. That just made me think about um, when I lived in Philadelphia for a long time, I used to walk everywhere because I didn't have a car and, um, and I used to pass, there was this one building that had trees growing out of the roof of it. And I always used to pass that and just feel some kind of, like there was a, an interesting sense of joy in seeing like how these trees could just find their way back you know like mm -hmm. where wherever the seed lands it's going to grow and it doesn't really matter I mean it does matter I'm not so, <laughs> but like in some ways we are incidental <laughs> um we make our marks and then you know other beings come in and do other things which I think is just really interesting like that um the way it becomes a, another part of the landscape. Well, I don't know how many people read um, Edgar Allan Bean's review of our show, but I loved his last paragraph where he was basically saying, you know, um, all the artists are going to be dead and all of our work will have deteriorated. And that's just, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> I thought yeah, that was that great. It was a lovely <laughs> moment. I liked that a lot. <laughs> I was grateful for the um, yeah. bluntness. Yeah. <laughs> and I know we're, we're kind of getting close to sort of the end of our conversation time, but I wanted to put out at least one more question, which is how, how do the materials you use in your work express what's at stake for you um, in your work in the world, um, however you wanna think about that question, but. Can you repeat the question, Kathleen? Just one more time. I, I can. It just um, out here a second, I'm sorry. Just how the materials you use um, express what is at stake for you, either in your work or in the world or however you want to think about the question. I mean, I think that my material choice reflects my concerns about what, what's going on because um, I moved from thinking about making paintings in a more traditional way where they're, you know, framed, you know, or not framed, but like stretched oil paintings, let's say, or something on a pristine sheet of paper and moved to working in textiles um, based on an instinct of wanting to be able to use it for something else. So the efforts of making a piece of art, but having it be portable and like something you could grab quickly, um, take with you and maybe use as a blanket or a tarp or something else. Um, so I think my material choices are uh, reflect a feeling of like what's at stake as far as our not so successful relationship right now with the natural world. So um, let's say, yeah, the, wanting the art art making process to have a double function where it could be useful, keep you warm or something like that. You know, it's a little doomsy, but also just to be able to pick it up and run. So. Um, Remember, my mom's a painter, and I know she has all these very large canvases that I think if 
stuff really went down that we just get left behind you know you can really <laughs> run off with with these huge paintings so <laughs> that's so funny karen um well i think you know in with my work i think i almost have the opposite um instinct to what karen's describing which is kind of funny but i think um you know with my work i'm really thinking a lot about uh immediacy of materials like what can give me the most immediate effect and a lot of these are traditional media that are very old that have been you know used by artists for you know many hundreds of years to do what i'm doing which is to kind of get the thought out quickly um so i feel like what i'm doing is kind of resorting to a very classical training um as an artist uh to achieve the, the objective that I want, which is the sort of um, transcription of the moment of looking, right? And the moment of the communication with the other, which in this instance and in most of my work would be a plant form of some kind or like a pattern emerging from the natural world or a shape that I've encountered that I don't really understand that I could not invent from my imagination. So, you know, I think that to me, that's how that's why materials are important to be specific about because if I choose them correctly, they lead to that kind of immediacy and um, spontaneity that I would personally have a hard time maintaining if the they were um, if the materials themselves were a slower use in terms of constructing them or making them. So I think maybe that's also why I will always be a painter and never a sculptor. Um, because that's just uh, a totally different modality in terms of thinking about like objects and their function, um, their kind of spiritual function as, as art. So that's me. In a nutshell. Um, well, I can, I can really relate to what Karen was talking about and that I really was trained as a painter. I painted for many, many years and then I took a, um, painting and stitching workshop at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. And I just loved it. And I loved um, what for me was this kind of um, uh, circumventing of, of editing in my mind of what to paint kind of thing. And just having the threads and the stitching kind of really brought me back to learning how to sew with my mom and our babysitters. and. I was obsessed with my dollhouse, making things for my dollhouse. And it became immediate in this way that I felt like I, I didn't have all these uh, painters, thousands of years of painters looking over my shoulders, you know, and it was just like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make this, you know, I'm going to figure this out. It really um, cut through a lot of that stuff for me. And I really like being able to pick it up for a little while, put it down. It's, it's really comforting to sit and stitch for like, 20 minutes, you know, and um, kind of get centered. And so, it, you know, and then it's, um, you know, there are other things that I do as well, but I, I find that, you know, cause it's interesting if I think about the domesticity angle and the stitching is that there is something very um, comforting and sort of community oriented, even though we don't, often stitched together anymore, sadly. Um, but um, there's just this kind of collective that goes out about it that reminds me of my family and, you know, so that's on a very personal level of why I use it, but. Um, yeah, I, I a lot to already think about. I think that relationship to painting has already um, been been articulated as, and I and I agree with it to a to a large amount. Um, the supports that I'm using for paintings are being sourced um, at a point where they're relegated to like trash. At that point, um, they're like throwaway, discarded items. Um, so I think that treating them in the language of painting or treating them in a fine art um, 
treatment is to like also ask questions about like what are those value systems um and that's interesting to me too right the idea of like again they're ready-made so there's already these systems of labors that have been like marinating in them to begin with and then through um painting to touch every surface and to address it and to give it value through your your labor and your perspective in viewing it as as um as an art object um that's that's interesting to me too in like in all the moments of it right and at what point does it stop being this other thing and also not like staying in those places either um so I guess that's how material shows up for me yeah in this conversation great thank you all for your thoughtful responses I mean um yeah there's so much more that we could talk about I think um but I think that's uh, we're oh Juliet did you want to could I, I just wanted to ask you, Kathleen, if you could articulate something that you wrote to us about that I think is so important about the um, um, plants being called they as opposed to it. That way, I just think that is, I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass right now and yeah. I'm sorry that really resonated for me. And if, just to share, if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a conversation that's been happening in herbalism for a while, but certainly, um, you know, with the publication of that book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, I think a lot more of us have been attending to that conversation about how do we, how do we change the way we speak about the plants um, to actually reflect the reality of how we relate to them, because I personally do not relate to anything in the world as a thing. But when we talk about, you know, I still find myself saying, um, I don't know, like that sparrow, it, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, why is the sparrow an it and I'm a something else, you know? Um, so really just bringing a lot of conscious awareness to that to the way that we describe things has been for me just part of part of the waking up out of the um out of the language of colonization out of the language of um the ways that we have been separated on purpose by systems of oppression, by, um, you know, people who want to make money out of the, out of everything. <laughs> um, so I'm, I guess that's, I don't know if that's helpful, I, but I definitely think, um, you know, braiding sweetgrass and, and Robin Wall Kimmerer's work has been very crucial to a lot of, a lot of the conversations that we're having, but certainly I, indigenous elders, I've studied with numerous people who um, have brought this up in teachings and, and thinking about plants as our ancestors and our elders, that we are, um, you know, evolutionarily speaking, we're pretty young on the planet. And how do we actually think about learning from the other beings that are on the planet with us rather than taking from them? And I think it has such an immediate, I don't know, after I read that in her book, I went outside and I was just looking at the plants and the trees and speaking they they like changing my thoughts and it was immediately so powerful it was just I, I, it was suddenly this circle you know it was like everyone together in this just really amazingly fast powerful way I thought Kathleen in in, in your um, studies have you heard shifting in the ideas of the wild and wilderness and and then I know the review of the the show it kind of ended in a phrase about you know 
the wild, like us, like the, all the artists are going to die, our work's going to disintegrate, and then there will be <laughs> the wild, you know, and even in this witchcraft poem, there's this, you know, you guys will all be gone, and or you, the gardener, will be gone, and then I'll be left with just the sun and the moon, you know, as the plant is saying that, but have you been hearing any shifting in that thinking of, of us and then wilderness or us and then the wild? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that is, that's been an ongoing conversation for a long time. I think we, I feel like we're very slow to change. You know, we, we can change quickly, but we don't choose to. Um, and I, yeah, I think, but I think in the field of um, environmental studies, there's a lot of shifting going on in, in terms of those conversations around what is wilderness versus like I study in environmental epics in the 1990s and it was all the, the wilderness out here and you know we were all trying to get to the wilderness and like having nature be that um, and not not acknowledging that nature is everywhere we look and you know whether we're sitting on a city street that has no visible trees or whatever there's nature there um yeah and then that what you talked about earlier too which i was saying in the um denise Levertov poem that when did we become separate from nature you know when did we as humans it's humans and nature when did that happen because we are all nature. <laughs> um, I want to see if there are questions from the audience, um, if anybody has things they want to hear from the artist. While we're waiting for questions, I'm going to give a little Speedwell plug, mm -hmm. which is to say that um, I feel so lucky to be included in this show at Speedwell. And I have had another a pop up show I had. And I also was one of the first shows that Speedwell did in 2016, I think. And um, it just, it's such a wonderful venue. The mission is so amazing. And just want to give a plug out there. If anybody wants to give a donation, we're really entering the fund, Speedwell is really entering the fundraising season right now. And it's really um, serious. We really need to make some money just to be blunt. And um, so anything would be greatly appreciated. You know, um, it's easy to do on the website and yeah, it's, a, it's just, it's a wonderful place with lots of unique shows and more coming up. It looks like we have a question from Grace Hager. Um, I'm wondering if this group of artists can talk about the changing seasons and if they see an impact on their work based on seasonality. That's a great question. Thanks, Grace. Um, I guess in my work, I go outside more when it's warm and I draw outside a lot in the summer. My partner has a beautiful garden and I love to draw there uh, and out in the woods. Um, and in the winter, I tend to bring little sticks and artifacts like that. I guess they're not artifacts, but natural bits into my studio. Uh, but no, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the seasons in a more overarching way. I think I just experience them pretty, pretty unreflectingly. Um, thank you for that good question. And I think um, for me, the, the change of the seasons right now, I, I for the first time did a, a quite a large garden project. And so throughout the whole summer, I was documenting it with photography. So I'm looking forward to having uh, less active, uh, you know, outdoor exploration happening and then being able to reflect upon it over the next, you know, the long main winter and, you know, the fall as well. So, um, 
yeah, I think that will shift shift my work quite a bit to have time with time with it indoors, collecting. Well, I know for me, um, in terms of making cyanotypes from actual flowers, that there was definitely this, you know, there's this time frame anywhere but in Maine. And I, when the, um, I've been really focusing on flowers that bees love to pollinate. And um, this spring when all the apple trees were in bloom and uh, there were all these bees and I was like, oh my God, they love the apple blossoms, you know? <laughs> and, 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 I, and it was happening so fast, you know, they, they were like the blossoms were started and then they were peaking. And then, and I, there was this sort of panic because I had to suddenly plan it all out because I, you really have like a week until they, you know, the blossoms start to fall off and they fly and, and that's all good too. But it definitely, I felt like, oh my God, I've got to like stay on top of this. And, and then the lilacs and then the, you know, the flowers just, they move so quickly. And um, it's, so, so that has really impacted, but, but I, I, I love that about it. I love that it's, you know, I got to like keep my wits about me. <laughs> um yeah I think that uh for me this time these transitions I I I actually I can get a little sad because I I love to be outside and working with a type of like abandon where you're not so much worried about like you're just survival too while you're outside um so I think I think it presents like a a, a a time of like harvest, like I'm just reflecting on like fall specifically, but a time of harvest and a time of um, gathering and like taking inventory in terms of what you have. I think also as an artist, it's like a strategy of breaking up. How does the work change too? It goes from, in, in my case, being like as big a scale as I want, um, really being able to use the land really immediately um, as a material. Um, and, and now is a time of like planning and then taking like stock of those kinds of things, um, which can be cool, right? Cause the scale can change and it becomes, I guess for me too, when you're working in the winter, smaller, um, touch operates differently too. Um, so it's, ex it's exciting too, but yeah, yeah. I always get a little sad too around this time of year. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> When people, when people are like, oh, the fall is so beautiful. And it's kind of like, eh. <laughs> yeah, but. So Grace is following up to say that um, there's an interesting sense of storing things up for the winter. Um, mm -hmm. practice. I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Are there any other questions from anybody? There must be someone out there. <laughs> if not, that's fine, of course. That's fine, that's fine. I just wanna, I'll, I'll take a moment to, do you guys ever know that book called um, Frederick about this field mouse? I, and it was um, Leone, something Leone who did the illustrations. And it was just this beautiful book about this group of field mice and, um, they were all gathering the nuts and everything in the summer and the spring to to you know save up and frederick was didn't participate in that frederick you know sat outside and he looked at the colors and he absorbed the sun and he thought about the textures and everything and they were all like frederick you know come on get to work get to work you know you're not doing anything and anyway as it goes on it turns out that frederick is the artist you know, and after when everybody's cold and they're all have eaten all their food, he comes out and he talks about the the sun and the colors and the flowers and the plants, and he raises their spirits. You know, and I, I just I just love that book. So you know, when Josephine was saying about storing up for the winter, and you know, I guess these are kind of our nuts, but really it's the those you know, be warm, you know, as you go into the winter. A friend of mine just 
gave me that book uh, last fall and said, you need to read this and take some hints from this book. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool book. You know, because it really is a lot of the times I wonder, you know, what's the, what is the artist's role? You know, like what, here's everybody, all the other mice are doing these really practical things for survival. And, you know, what, what are we doing? Looking at the flowers, you know? <laughs> so I found that book to be very helpful as a child and continues to be. Yeah, I, do, I do think it can be practical in a way to, to be making these works, you know, it, I find them to be models that um, in some way can instruct or help make connections or remap our, our thoughts a little bit. So I think there's practicality in it as well. Yeah, oh, I know there, I know there's yeah. for me, I just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, Kathleen, you asked um, about, you know, we, the takeaways we hope people might have from the show. And, and that was one that I was hoping that people could um, experience these different interpretations and these different versions of the natural forms in the space and, and draw their own connections, but feel some familiarity and being called to look closely, you know, in the way that they would perhaps working, you know, walking around out in the woods or something like that. In the way that the show is set up, there's a landscape kind of experience there. And even with, you know, the, the doors being just present, you can picture being out in the field and coming across these abandoned objects. And so in some way I thought that would be the takeaway that I would hope there would be um, like a familiarity to look to look closely and and learn some new connections between things so I've been enjoying um, Annika's background looking at Josephine's car doors mm -hmm. with the landscape driving by <laughs> mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Right. You know, as we've been talking it's interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, the actual cars moving moving by. I think that's such an interesting part of it. And the space used to be a car dealership. I think was really interesting too. So yeah, and when you stand where the photo prints are, and the cars are going by, and the car doors, and it's all really it's great connections. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Thank you uh, to Kathleen and to the artists for joining us this evening. And thank you to the audience for joining us as well. Uh, we really appreciate the time you spend with us tonight. Um, and thank you very much. And we hope you uh, to see you at the gallery to see Witchcraft in person. Again, it's on view until October 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Kathleen and everybody. Thank you, everyone. And the audience. Thank you.